Okay, before I do my um, review of the Azerbaijan Grand Prix and go into the audio clips that I recorded, I'm just going to do this video. Now, what I do is similar to probably what some of you will do. When you've watched a sporting event, you still might go to what is regarded as an authentic source, a media source, and have a read about it and see what they're saying about it. Um, many people will. Many people who have not even seen it would go and want to read about it because that would be written about, you would hope, um, in an accurate manner by an authentic journalist who's paid to write a written account of an event to help inform and educate you about it so that you were able to get a good understanding of a situation. So what is an authentic source? Well, it's got to be the British Broadcasting Corporation, hasn't it? You know, the taxpayer funded organisation. So they're not writing with any form of agenda, are they? Oh, no, of course not. So um, we'll um, have a look to see what's on the BBC Sport and see about today's race. McLaren's constructors lead a seismic development, all in inverted commas. They love the use of inverted commas these days on the BBC Sport website. So here we go. Let's have a look at what... Um, Who's this boy? Let's 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 have a check. Who's this boy? Oh, by um, the F1 correspondent. No longer the chief. Um, no longer the chief. He must have been downgraded from chief status. OK, but if you Google image him, this is him. Corrupt journalist Andrew Benson, corrupt prick from the BBC. Now, before I get into his article, uh, every day is a school day. And what we try to do uh, when you're educating kids um, is to give them a structure as to how to go about tackling a task um, and how to actually demonstrate that you've got an understanding and knowledge of a certain situation. And surely as a journalist reporting on a situation, you want to convey to the reader uh, and actually uh, educate them. Okay, pass on the knowledge that you have in order to educate them about the, the situation, the context of a situation. Uh, and guidelines for doing such a things would be, for example, this. Um, when reporting on an event that's happened, uh, that event is essentially history. It's happened, so it's, you're reporting on it or something that's happened in the past. So this would be a good, um, a good, a good kind of template to follow. So... Answering non-sourced based questions. Now, Andrew has his sources. Andrew will often refer to insiders. So he has his sources from with inside. So he can refer to them. OK, but non-source based um, uh, questions either identify three relevant points or describe slash explain two relevant points. Let's go and see if Andrew's capable of doing that. Uh, when answering explain questions, so when Andrew's explaining the dynamics of a situation to us, what have you got to do? Either explain three reasons or explain two reasons in depth. If you're unsure how much depth you should go into, it's best to explain three reasons instead, Andrew, okay? Um, you know, you, you've got your sources at your disposal. You can have your reasons from your understanding of the dynamics of the sport, which you can draw upon. Um, you can just look at the evidence. You can look at the data. You can look at trends. You can then come up with the reasons which might uh, account for what you might be seeing, Andrew. OK, um, answering how far questions Explain at least two reasons for one side of the argument. Explain at least two reasons for the other side of the argument, Andrew. And add a conclusion that comes to an overall judgment about how far and support it with evidence. So, for example, Andrew, when we're talking about the decline of the Red Bull's uh, performance. Why would that be, Andrew? OK. Why would that be? Um, give us two reasons why it might be and give us two reasons why other reasons why it could be something else. OK, and then come to a conclusion. Let us know what you think it is, Andrew, in the comments section. 
Okay. When answering who, which factor is more important questions, explain the one person stroke factor is important. Sorry, why one person or factor is important. Uh, what could that be, Andrew? Could it be an FIA rule change which has coincided with a performance decline? Indicating what, Andrew? What might that indicate? OK, this is the sort of things that we're encouraging 15 and 16 year old children to be able to do, Andrew. OK, explain why the other person slash factor is important. OK, such as the development of the other teams, perhaps out developing Red Bull. And that might not be the reason that they were cheating beforehand and that the rules are now been amended to reiterate the rules, you know, to make them really clear to Red Bull who didn't understand them and their genius designer who didn't understand the rules and therefore was cheating. You know, make it aware, make people aware of the dynamics of the situation, Andrew. You can do it. OK. And explain why one person slash factor is more important than the other person slash factor. So. This is how you come to a conclusion. You can weigh up the pros and cons. You know, you can say, were Red Bull cheating? OK, was their car handling really well up until this point? And then the rules have changed and now all of a sudden it doesn't handle. OK, or is it that the other teams seem to have got loads faster and have caught them? Or oh, which one of those seems to be the more dominant factor? And then draw your conclusion for your comment section, Andrew Benson. OK, answering source based question, uh, answering how far does this source explain X questions? See, I'll leave a link for you, Andrew, because this might help you write your future articles, because there's, like I say, many a 15 year old child that could do a better job than what you do. Uh, use contextual knowledge to explain other reasons for X. You see, the contextual knowledge that I rely on is the knowledge that you are corrupt, Andrew Benson. You're corrupt. You are being employed by the BBC to report on the sport of Formula One. And you lie. You have hidden the fact that Abu Dhabi 2021 was a fraud. You've hidden all of the key aspects which would demonstrate that it was a fraud. You are aware of those, Andrew, and yet you've never revealed them and you've never, ever written anything and published it on the BBC to actually expose it to the world that it was a fraud. You're fully aware of it. You're fully aware of this video because I'm going to actually tag you in on X. I'm going to email this to the BBC, Andrew, so that you're fully aware and continually. This is what you do. So, again, bearing in mind how to answer a GCSE history question. OK, how to uh, explain, demonstrate to somebody that you know what you're talking about. You can explain what happened and why it happened, you know. Surely a useful template for writing about something when reporting on something as a journalist. Andrew Benson, let's see. Uh, let's see if he's passed the test as a Formula One correspondent. Here we go. Just four hours ago, Lando Norris was torn between disappointment and delight after the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. The disappointment stemmed from, as he put it, what could have been and a possible victory he felt he had been again unfairly in the un inverted commas deprived of fighting for by some bad luck in qualifying but de oh, it's going up stop going up like that i didn't want you to do that there must be i don't know technology shows you the limitations of my ability um but I have to uh, I have to deal with that. Where are we? Where are we? Bad looking qualifying, but delight that the race had been won by his teammate Oscar Piastri. That Norris himself had played a significant part in that victory and that McLaren had end ended the day replacing Red Bull as leaders of the Constructors Championship. I'll do it this way. 
hopefully it won't run away with me. This is a seismic development, even if it felt like it has been coming for a while, such as been McLaren's run of form and Red Bull's precipitous tumble from their pedestal. So we've we've made the statement that Red Bull have had a precipitous tumble from their pedestal, Andrew. We'd all be interested in finding out more about that. Why would that be, Andrew? You know, is this linked to the fact that the FAA have had to, or seemingly had to, add a couple of lines into the technical regulations to restate what those te technical regulations already stated, Andrew? That's strange, isn't it, Andrew? Why would they have to do that, Andrew? Tell us. All of these, oh, these are all the things that you could be uh, thinking about how to structure your answer when giving a report to people, Andrew. OK, this is the first time McLaren have led the Constructors' Championship for more than a decade. Oh, excellent historical context there, Andrew. Well done. One point um, since the first race of 2014. And even that was an anomaly. Their car was uncompetitive at the start of that season. They just had a decent result in a race in which faster cars faltered for one reason or another. McLaren last won the Constructors title in 1998, albeit they scored more points than any other team in 2007, only to be disqualified because of the Spygate controversy. And we've got a link there to the Spygate controversy. Oh, excellent context there Andrew uh, to implicate Sir Lewis Hamilton within the uh, the Spygate controversy so great reporting there uh, well done you Andrew Benson um, what do you do for money honey and uh, who pays you to write in this man that is nice historical context what about what we are what we're seeing now recent history with the red bulls precipitous tumble from their pedestal hey what what's causing that andrew because it's nice to know when mclaren last had success okay but the team that has dominated since they cheated at abu dhabi 2021 well the whole sport did the whole sport contrived that but then they broke the cost cap in that year OK, giving them an unfair advantage, using some of that money to develop the car that they then used in 2022. And that car then ran away with that championship. Last year, we saw the most dominant car this, this so-called show has ever seen. OK, it was absolutely light years ahead of everything else um, as a development of the 2022 car. And then this year, for the first five or six races, it was more of the same, wasn't it? What's happened? The wheels seem to have fallen off. This precipitous tumble. Tell us about that aspect and can you give us some reasons why that might be, Andrew? Because that is the key here. OK. It has been a long road back to here and team principal Andrea Stella summed up the achievement well. OK. We don't have to forget that at the start of 2023, we were last. When we started the season and now we lead the classification, he said. It is a huge milestone, possible thanks to great work and hard work and quality work of the entire team. That's a nice quote. Stella went on to emphasise, though, the importance of not letting it distract them from the job in hand. The second is already over, Stella said. We don't look at the classification, we just focus on executing at every single event, delivering the upgrades we still plan to take to the future races. Because the car is still not fast enough to create some boring races. Sorry? Because the, the car is still not fast enough to create some boring races, which is not in the interest of F1, but is definitely the way we want to go racing. Okay, so what he's saying is, They've not reached the domination that Red Bull were, well, they, they had in 2023. Their car is not streaks ahead of everything else in the same way that the Red Bull car of 2023 was. 
and appeared to be at the start of this season. This is um, lovely um, that you're telling us exactly what he said, Andrew, using your sources. OK, giving us quotes, giving us quotes from your sources. Tick. Excellent work. Can you provide additional context for this, Andrew? OK, so we have to work. Sorry, we have work to do to make the car faster. We need to remain humble and keep the feet on the ground because there is not much to choose between the top teams. Here we go then. From Red Bull's perspective, the milestone is every bit as big. This is the first time they've not led a championship since the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix in 2022, two and a half years ago. Uh, why is that then, Andrew? Max Verstappen. Oh, Max Verstappen won seven of the first 10 races this season, but he has not won for seven Grand Prix. And unless there is some kind of miracle turn... Oh, a miracle. Maybe they get some help from the racing gods. Thank you for that, Andrew. OK, we all know about the racing gods, don't we? Um, unless there's a miracle turnaround, that run is likely to extend to eight for Singapore next weekend uh, is very much not Red Bull's kind of track and they expect to trouble. OK, so what, what would make the track Red Bull's kind of track and why is Singapore not Red Bull's kind of track, Andrew? You need you need to explain that. You can't just make a statement. Oh, that's that's not Red Bull's kind of track. Oh, that is Red Bull's com um, kind of track. Think of, Think the examiner is dumb. OK, think of the person that's reading this doesn't know and you need to use your skills to give them a full understanding of the situation, Andrew. OK, this is what we tell every 15 year old. OK, you can develop, Andrew, with this advice. And I could develop by learning how to operate this computer to help me read this. But we'll get there. Every day is a school day and we're all developing our skills. Um, anyway. In the Drivers' Championship, Norris clawed back only three points on Verstappen in Baku, and as a result, the average of points per race he needs to gain on the Red Bull driver to beat him by the end of the year increased slightly when McLaren went into Baku hoping it would reduce. But given the circumstances of the weekend, that was very much a win for Norris, even if he did not mention it. What aren't we mentioning here, Andrew? The precipitous decline of the Red Bull team. OK. Um, can you give us reasons for that? Can you give us reasons for that? Let's have a look. It was unfair and ruined my weekend. Piastri and Norris finished first and fourth in Baku. At the end of the race, they had started second and 15th. Piastri's win was brilliant. Norris's rise just as remarkable. The fact he caught past and beat Verstappen, despite starting the race nine places behind the Red Bull driver, surprised both Norris and Stella. <laughs> this is lovely, Andrew. Why did Norris start so low down? Question. He was unlucky to catch a brief yellow flag in the first part of qualifying. McLaren felt the yellows for the slow-moving Alpine of Esteban Ocon as he came onto the pit straight were not even necessary, but they forced him to abort his lap and he was knocked out after the first session. Nor Norris qualified 17th but gained two, two, sorry, gained back two places following penalties for Alpine's Pierre Gasly and Mercedes' Lewis Hamilton. Norris was still brooding about it after the race. This is this is wonderful, Andrew. It was out of my control, Norris said. It was something that was unfair and cost me a good amount of points in the championship today and ruined my weekend. It's disappointing, especially because of how good the car was today. I'm the guy thinking about what could have been, not what we did today necessarily. The car was flying. It was so good. It almost made me more annoyed about yesterday and how silly that yellow flag was. That's the glass half empty side of Norris. The glass half full version was also on show. 
That was when he considered how he had not only held Verstappen at bay on older tyres for a number of laps after the Red Bull driver's pit stop, but actually... This, this is... Uh, Lovely, Andrew, lovely. But actually pulled away once Alex Albon's Williams had pitted out of Norris's way. Then, after Norris's own later stop, he clawed back 15 seconds on Verstappen and passed him for what at the time was sixth place, but became fourth when Ferrari's Carlos Sainz and Red Bull Sergio Perez crashed whilst disputing third place with two laps to go. To create a gap ahead of him and to box and still overtake him, Norris said, I wasn't expecting to do such a thing. Stella said, I would never have said we would beat Verstappen on track. Why would you have never said that? OK, why would you? Why has it not looked like that was possible for the last two and a half years? OK, that rocket ship Red Bull. Verstappen has won every race we've ever seen because he's the greatest driver we've ever seen. You've told us this, Andrew. I've read multiple articles of you where um, you struggle to contain your lust for Max Verstappen. Um, what What's changed, Andrew? What has changed in Max Verstappen's fortunes? OK, because all you're doing, you're giving us lots of quotes about, oh, he said this and he said that and he said this and he said that. This is lovely, Andrew. Can you uh, add some meat on the bone, some some context? OK. Um, uh, where are we? For Norris, better even that. Sorry. For Norris, better even than that was that was the way he helped Piastri to victory. Perez, who ran third in the first stint, had pitted for fresh tyres before Piastri and was on course to be ahead after the McLaren made its stop. But Perez had rejoined behind Norris, running a long first stint on a reverse strategy, starting on hard tyres, and Norris was able to delay the Red Bull just enough to ensure Piastri rejoined the track, still in second place behind the race leader, leader Charles Leclerc's Ferrari. Without Lando's help, Perez would have pitted ahead of Oscar, Stella said, so 50% of Oscar's victory is shared with Lando. It shows we are approaching racing as a team. Again, this is lovely uh, using your insider sources to give these quotes, uh, Andrew. And it was this, rather than beating Verstappen, that was the highlight of Norris's day. <laughs> rather than beating Verstappen, uh, it was this. That was the highlight of Norris's day. Thanks for that, Andrew. Norris said the main point was I defended against Checo, allowed him to not get ahead of Oscar, and that allowed Oscar to get a win. I did my small part for the team, which I'm really happy for because it got us P1 in the constructors. That's the thing that makes me the happiest. OK, so we're still back to the Constructors Championship and Red Bull's uh, precipitous fall from their pedestal, Andrew. Um, we're going to get there. I'm sure we're going to get there for it because, again, the examiner, OK, the reader will get a bit bored if you don't make your points. You know, you've got to make your point, Andrew. OK, not just make give quotes. He said, she said, he said, she said. OK, you've got to explain the context. All right. Norris's race was outstanding on every level, Stella said. Absolutely brilliant execution from Lando's point of view. I can't see any point in the 51 laps in which he could have done a better job today. But it was at least matched by Piastri on his way to victory. Oh, it's all about Lando, is it? Not Oscar Piastri's quality drive to win the race. No? OK. The decisive moment of the race came just after the pit stops. Leclerc had dominated the first sprint pulling out a six-second lead over Piastri in 15 laps and looked in control. Piastri made his stop a lap before Leclerc and somehow the gap came down to one and a half seconds. Leclerc said Ferrari would have to look into how he had incurred such an unusually large loss. Hmm, we'd have to look into that. Can't you look into that, Andrew? Can't you uh, work out what that unusually large loss was okay it'd be interesting wouldn't it that would make the reader interested to provide them with an explanation for that andrew two laps later piastri was on the ferrari's tail 
and from there he made an audacious surprise attack into turn one and grabbed the lead. Oh, two cars are racing and it's surprising that one made an attempt to overtake the other. Oh, audacious and surprising. OK, um, before spending the rest of the race holding the Ferrari at bay with a masterclass of defensive driving. Finally, Leclerc's challenge fell away when his tyres cried enough with three laps to go. Um, Piastri came from so far back to fa pass the Ferrari that in the car Leclerc felt the McLaren was going to overshoot. Piastri wasn't even sure himself. I was pleasantly surprised that I actually made the corner, Piastri said. It was a high risk, high commitment move. But that's what I needed to do to try to win this race because, you know, I wasn't really going to be that keen to finish second. So I had to try on the pit wall. Stella was just as impressed. Oh, he said, she said, thanks once again for this. Oh, this is incredible journalism, Andrew. Incredible journalism. Just use these little uh, quote marks all the way through. Pad it all out. He said this. She said that. He said this. She said that. There you go. There's the article done. Cha-ching. Money for nothing and your chips for free. Uh, my instinct was he is going to go long, Stella said. I wanted to emphasise the precision and execution to be on the apex curb in corner one. I was surprised, but Oscar is always surprising us with his talent and ability. And today he gave also a demonstration of his mental strength. Oh, the demonstration of his mental strength. OK, you see, Andrew, what we're doing here, we're starting with the um, the quotation mark. OK, um, but but that that quotation um doesn't finish because you, you don't end it to, to complete the quotation. But then the next thing you do is you, you start the next quotation. Um, there's, there's some grammatical issues there that could be improved upon. And therefore, we're going to have to mark you down on the grammar side of things uh, for this piece. He drove like a driver that has a lot of experience and has been under this kind of pressure before, who can look with one eye on the mirror and one on the braking. And he did it with great precision and pretty controlled. No end to that quote either, Andrew. That, that, it's a reoccurring uh, error there, Andrew. Phenom phenomenal driver. Brilliant drive. Uh, I'm guessing these are all from the same um, person because they're just quote after quote after quote, aren't they, Andrew? Um, you know, you can't just give an answer where you're just giving everybody's quotes all the time. Um Right, well, oh, we're getting to the key point here of um, Red Bull's uh, precipitous fall from their pedestal. Verstappen's lead is still decent. The coordination at McLaren was the kind of teamwork they'd come into the weekend planning, if not quite the way they'd expected. Right, OK. In the days before Baku, Stella revealed in an exclusive interview with C... Oh, an exclusive interview... There he is, Andrew Benson, with his insider sources, you know, the industry insiders talking to Andrew. So Andrew knows. Andrew's up there with the secrets. OK, an exclusive interview with the BBC Sport that McLaren had agreed with the drivers that Piastri would help Norris in his bid to overhaul Verstappen if the circumstances arose. The yellows in qualifying put paid to that. And it, well, it wasn't the fact that Lando hadn't already set a good lap. And it wasn't Lando to blame for not already setting a good lap. It's the yellows in qualifying. OK, so we're contextualising that, aren't we? That's fine. We're ab absolving Lando of any responsibility for that situation. That's fine. It's just the yellows in qualifying that put paid to that. And instead, Norris ended up helping Piastri. But Stella said they would review things again before Singapore. It would be no surprise if Norris was to get the backing he needs over the next seven races. Uh, at Red Bull, here we go. Verstappen was in a matter-of-fact sort of mood. OK, oh, I'd love to know what a matter-of-fact sort of mood is. And so would you, Andrew, because um, you struggle with facts, don't you? You struggle with matter-of-fact. Uh, instead, you just push narrative, don't you, Andrew? Uh, so we'll, we'll see what 
Verstappen's matter-of-fact mood is. Was this a wasted opportunity to extend his lead over Norris? He was asked. Oh, we're asking questions and we're seeing what Max says in the comments section. Yes, it is. But you can also turn it around, he said. I think they could have done a better job as well. How did he feel about losing the Constructors' Championship lead? It is never nice to see that. It didn't help what happened with Checo and Carlos. I'm sure we can do better. The party is not over yet. We will try to get that back. And his thoughts on the Drivers' Championship? They need to have a perfect end of the year, he said. The gap is still decent. Why is the gap still decent, Andrew? Oh, is that because Verstappen won seven of the ten races and hasn't won since? Why has he not won since? Why has the performance of that Red Bull car fallen off a cliff? Could that Red Bull car have been illegal in those first ten races that he won seven off? And if it was illegal, should those results still stand, Andrew? Should Red Bull be disqualified from those first ten races of the season for running a car which had illegal components on it that the FIA, the governing body of the sport, had to then amend the regulations or clarify the regulations by repeating them using different words to clarify to Adrian Newey that you're not allowed to use asymmetric braking, Adrian Newey, the genius, OK? It, explore the dynamics of the situation, Andrew. Remember back to that paper I showed you at the start, you know, how to um, give a bit of advice to 15-year-olds that are sitting their GCSE exams as to how to write about a historic occurrence, OK? How to contextualise things, how to uh, explore a point and give reasons, two reasons for, two reasons against, two reasons what might have impacted the, or account for the Red Bull performance drop-off, two reasons which might account for the, um, the situation that McLaren find themselves in, having appeared to now have overhauled the performance of that Red Bull car. Tell us, Andrew, please. Because now they need to have a perfect end of the year based on what happened at the start of the year. Is what happened at the start of the year valid, Andrew? All sorts of questions that we can ask, uh, but you don't provide the answers. All you can do is just hit us with quote after quote after quote after quote. Because he said, she said, he said, she said, he said, she said. And you're the chief journalist, Andrew Benson. You're the chief journalist. What do they pay you, Andrew Benson? What do they pay you? Well, what does the BBC pay you? And what does the sport of Formula One pay you? Because surely um, to do things the way you do, you know, to parrot the narrative the way you do, um, it can't just be the BBC that is paying you to do so. Can it? No, no. Conflict of interest there. I would suggest, Andrew. The BBC really need to investigate the quality and calibre of their journalists uh, and understand that their journalist is actually reporting a narrative rather than the reality of a situation. Their journalist is corrupt. Their journalist has concealed a fraud, making them complicit with a fraud. The BBC, therefore, is implicated and the BBC is therefore complicit with fraud. Understand this, BBC. You as an entity, you as the British Broadcasting Company is complicit with a global fraud and you will pay the penalty. The CEO of the BBC or whoever's in, the, in charge, you are going to pay the price of this for employing a corrupt journalist. This is what is going to happen, and I'm going to ensure that it does. There's going to be no hiding place for you. Just be aware. Anyway, but I would make this as a comment on the BBC's, um, on, the, on, the, on your web page in the comments section, but I've been blocked from doing so, because what the BBC don't like is when they have a complaint, when somebody complains to them, uh, their, their manner of dealing with such a thing is... Uh, to block the complainant. Thank you for that 
the BBC. Silence the dis dissenting voices uh, that is operating in a totalitarianism kind of way. Is that what we are? We have to pay our license fee uh, in order to for you to report your lies to us. Uh, and if we say to you what you are reporting to us is lies, you block us. But we still have to pay the license fee. Thank you for that, the BBC. OK, uh, I'm sure you're in breach of certain laws there. We'll, we'll do another video on that just in case you're not aware as a media company uh, and as a broadcaster, what laws you are bound by. OK, but we'll do that because I know this one's going on for a long period of time. Um, Norris, for his part, does not like to talk about the Drivers' Championship. He says he is just taking it one race at a time, but he understands the significance of McLaren's achievement in getting to where they are. The team are giving us a car that can go out and win, he said. More quotes. Think back to the first race of the year. We were behind Mercedes and now we are long, a long way ahead of them. They have done a good job. We have done an amazing job to catch Red Bull, to be outscoring and outpacing them and to be the top team. In F1 is something we should be very proud of. It's incredible that you've caught up. Um, that's it. That's it. F1 in 10 years, the Grand Prix ball. OK, we'll do a video on that one in a bit as well, because that's a load of rubbish. That's the best that you can do, Andrew. That's the best you can do. So you start your article, you start your article here, where are we, this is a seismic development, even if it has felt like it's been coming for a while, such has been McLaren's run of form and Red Bull's precipitous tumble from their pedestal, okay, McLaren, you see articles entitled McLaren's Constructors Lead, a seismic development. All right. So so you're going to this article it was supposedly right about McLaren's Constructors title. Sorry, Constructors Championship lead and it being a seismic development. All right. That's what you've entitled this. So that is what you are leading the reader to believe that this is about. McLaren's constructors lead a seismic development. Right. So what would be the factors that have caused McLaren to gain the lead? And why is this a seismic development? And what are the factors that are affecting that? And the only thing that you have actually said about it, essentially is um, this is a seismic development even if it has felt like it's been coming for a while such has been McLaren's run of form and Red Bull's precipitous tumble from their pedestal and the rest is just what he said and what she said and a little bit of all oh, all oh, but Spygate but Spygate but Spygate yeah that that's um that's about all your article consists of, isn't it, Andrew? Have you explored why Red Bull, you know, the team that you fluff, you, if you don't know what a fluffer is, Andrew, Google it, mate. Google what a fluffer is, right? Because that's you. Um, yeah, if if you, you um, what are, why has Red Bull fallen from grace? Why are they no longer performing? Why has the performance of that Red Bull car fallen off a cliff why has the best car this the sport has ever seen the 2023 red bull car why even that was faster than this year's car it would appear andrew it's not suffering with the same problems that yes so why why have they not reverted to that oh it's the development yeah, the, the car that they were using for the first 10 races of the season and the dominance that that had well the new car or the development of it is um, is handling worse. So why aren't they reverting back to uh, how how they were running it for the first 10 races of the season when Max won seven of those races, Andrew? 
Tell us what the insiders say, Andrew, using your specialist sources, being the F1 chief journalists that they're all going to talk to. You know, because you had lots of uh, insiders say when we were talking about Christian Horner and um, the the so-called um, the things that he was doing, you know, like J Jermaine Jenis from the BBC that, you know, when he when he's um, sexting his co-workers and gets fired from the job um, and Christian Horner's uh, sexting his co-workers and um Red Bull employ a barrister, you know, to do uh, an investigation and find that, oh, yeah, there's nothing to see here. Uh, and then they get another one to do another investigation to find, oh, yeah, there's there's nothing to see here. And your insiders, Andrew, they, they know all about that, don't they? Maybe Jermaine Janus should get the same barrister uh, to do an investigation uh, to find out that uh, there's 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 nothing to see here either. Um Talk us through that, Andrew. Talk us through that. Oh, you can't, can you, Andrew? You never do. This is uh, your chief, Andrew Benston. The, uh, the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, British journalists at their finest. You know, ultimately, it would be responsibility. It would be responsible for the the downfall of the BBC and the loss of the CEO's job and head of BBC Sport and everybody that's enabled him. Okay, um, it's an abuse, Andrew. It's a, an abuse of your position. It's an abuse. I mean, the BBC are uh, used to harbouring abusers, though. Um, so you know, something that. Yeah, they they cover that sort of shit up. They've always done it, haven't they? They've always done it. That's for another video. Anyway, enough for this one. Um, the my uh, analysis of the audio of the race will come when I get a chance to do it, and then I'm going to get back into Abu Dhabi 2021. Who was involved and expose more to the extent of how Mercedes were in on it acting in front of the cameras to create the footage that's going to build into the entire narrative that the global population was fed uh, about that to convince us all that the key thing here was Verstappen was able to pit to the fresh soft compound tyres and Hamilton couldn't. And look at what they're showing us. Oh, the frustrated Mercedes team. But Red Bull played the clever cards to be able to do it. And ignore the fact that they're breaking the rules. But now you're going to see the race off. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a key thing was the tyres, wasn't it? Nothing to do with the fact that they broke the rules. And that they knew they were breaking the rules. And they don't tell you what the implications of breaking their rules are. What the rules are actually for. Whose races are implicated? Why none of the other teams actually um, protested when they all should have done? Um, so they all just went, oh, that's fine. We'll, we'll keep quiet about this. Who benefited? What? How corrupt was the steward's appeal? The list goes on and on and on and on and on. And this man, Andrew Benson, has reported nothing about it. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing, Benson. It's because you're corrupt. Absolutely corrupt. I would suggest you do uh, a look into law when it comes to requirements and responsibilities of journalists. Because you're going to have to form a defence, Andrew Benson. Anyway, thank you for your time on this one. I know this kind of video is not for everybody. There's a lot of people that um, they only want to get excited by uh, Formula One. They, their, their Formula One content needs to reflect the action. They want people that are going to go, yeah, wow, talk really fast because this is really exciting, everybody. And like Ted Kravitz, you need to be jumping up on your sofa because... Um, you know, Karun will be, oh, this is this is so exciting. This is this is the best thing I'm ever watching. They're all, they're all doing it. You know, that's how they want you to be. So they have to tell you that they're excited about it to get you to be excited about it. 
most other sports they don't have to do that but formula one they do um but anyway that'll do for this video and uh more to come soon thank you for your time